Testing, one, two, three. Testing, one, two, three. Test, test. Test, test, test. One, two, test, one, two. Okay, we're good. Good evening. I'd like to welcome everyone to our first evening workshop in Curry County that I know of. If you would please rise with me and join in the Pledge of Allegiance to our flag. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I see Dick Tylock out there, so I feel safe now. I'd like to start the meeting with just a reminder that I forgot this morning, if you don't mind, um, on the 27th, which is this, uh, this weekend, from 9 to 5 at the Sheriff's Office here, and there's also another drop point in, uh, at, on Lower Harbor Road in Brookings. It's a drug take back. If anyone has any prescription drugs or has knows of anyone that does that would just like to get rid of them with no questions asked, the Sheriff's Department will be taking those from you on Saturday the 27th from I believe 9 to 5 p.m. All right, so let's, uh, do we have any uh, amendments to the agenda? Hearing none, may I have a motion, please? I move that we approve the agenda as written. Second, Mr. Chair. Any further comments? Roll, please. Commissioner Gold. Aye. Vice Chair Boyce. Yes. Chair Pash. Yes. Motion carried unanimously. Okay, next we're going to have public comments. Uh, I would, uh, well, wait a minute. Let me see. I don't know if we have any. I'm just public. I could have helped you sort those. By the Since all of the comments are related to the project, item. perhaps we go ahead with the presentation? Well, that's what I, I was just making sure that they were all to that, so. We're just helping. <laughs> all right. <laughs> All right, so if we, yeah, if you wouldn't mind, uh, let's go ahead and go to, uh, immediately to number four, a presentation from uh, Curry County Voices. Good evening, commissioners. Let me do this as quickly and as briefly as I can. I know there are many people here who have things they want to talk to you about. This all started, I think maybe Ms. Smelser was the only one around in this room at the time back in 2015 when the then county attorney, Mr. Herbeach, disclosed to the Board of Commissioners that the state of the use of the public access channel by Curry County was inadequate to meet the requirements to keep it, that Charter had the right to revoke those channels and to seek a refund of the PEG funds they had paid to you, which had accumulated to that point of close to 90 to $100,000. A task force was appointed. It recommended that there be a two-phase steps taken. The first phase was to acquire the equipment to make this room efficient, to make the equipment in the closet behind this room efficient so that you could produce and record your meetings and at the same time, the equipment could be used to feed your website as well and to provide the ability of people in this room to hear you because back in those days, the microphones at the podium and out there only went to this recording for the station and people in this room couldn't hear. That was implemented. Phase two was that once that all worked was to look at having a use of the second channel for public access, public education and governmental access from the community. There was a minor problem with whether the equipment charter had would allow that to happen. But as of the spring of 2018, you 
this commission voted to grant the Gold Beach Rotary Foundation doing business as Curry County Voices a permit to put educational and governmental programming three days a week on your channel. We entered into a, and also you voted to spend a up to $15,000 of your PEG restricted funds that you couldn't use for anything else to get us equipment. We got that equipment in May using your consultant, Brent Media. We had people trained during the summer. And in September of 2018, we put on our first program on Channel 182. I'd like to give you a snapshot of the results that we have made in these six, almost seven months. <coughs> We now have 17 people trained <coughs> to use the equipment that was provided to us. Three of them happen to reside in the North County and three of them are in the South County. So we really have the ability to record and put on the county channel programming throughout the, ch the county. If you we took advantage of the advice of Brandt Media concerning the sustainability of cable, and we set up a, a website for currycountyvoices.com, and we put all of our programming, with one exception, on that website using YouTube. So our programming, like your programming, not only can be seen in Curry County, but anyone in the world who has YouTube access can look at that programming. In fact, the first program we did on that September day happened to be when I had to be in Boston and I sat in a corridor outside a, an alumni function at MIT with my cell phone watching live the candidates forum that was taking place at the library here in Gold Beach. If you look at our website, you will see 41 programs have been put there. They range from programming to train people for emergencies, ready, prep, go, programming on cooking. We have three Oregon State University Extension cooking shows on, and we may get a fourth in May. There's another show being at the library. We have programs focusing on the arts. The lit on literature and what's really exciting is we have programming produced by students. We have a working relationship at Brookings Harbor High School and if you look at the website you will see two shows called Brew and News which are produced by the high school students on news of what's happening in the campus and a new one called Greg Talks where one of the faculty members has students learning how to do public speaking and they go to the artistic theater down there and these, the show that's on there, two young men happen to get up on stage and talk for 15 plus minutes about something that's exciting to them. S Friday I had the occasion to go out to Point of Rocks and film a science excursion out of Gold Beach High School and we are working with, with that faculty member to have the students produce a program for us that we can then put on that is student produced. We have programs on community needs. We have programs on government issues. We had the candidates forum I alluded to. And when I say we have programs that we don't put on our website or it is for the League of Women Voters. They are very protective of their footage. They don't want anyone taking their events and slicing and dicing it to put in campaign literature. So for example, we have three candidate forums they did last week. They will be on this weekend, we hope, but they'll only be on channel 182 in an effort to protect them against being abused uh, by one or more of the candidates. And we have many more to come. Our equipment includes the three cameras you gave us. 
You gave us two laptops. We now have a third that was donated. We need much more. Right now, we're not filming programs in Brookings Harbor because we only have one camera available to do it down there. We're not filming something up here that could be filmed tonight because we don't have a camera to do it with. And when Mr. Huddle negotiated the new contract with Charter, he negotiated very strongly to keep those peg, restricted peg funds coming at a rate of 50 cents per month per subscriber. And part of the basis of doing that was our 10-year plan for equipment we need. So at, at some point, I'll be talking to your staff about including in the budget for this year money to buy us more cameras, because we could easily keep five of them busy on a regular basis and generate much more programming. We have transisted, tran we're in the transition from being funded by grants to being funded by sponsorships. We are halfway there. We have in hand in April the sponsors, half the sponsorships we need to fund all of the next fiscal year. And in May we will be out looking for more sponsorships and we believe we will certainly achieve them. The reason we have done that, in part, is because it's hard to get funds to support what we need the support for. And we have two expenses. We have an expense for insurance, and we have an expense to have Brandt Media work with us in training, helping us keep access, control of our equipment. And more importantly, they're the only ones involved with Curry County Voices that can go near charter and work with Charter about getting programming on that channel so that we don't interfere or run any risk of interfering with your relationship with Charter. One of the things I may have put in my request for the workshop involved the fees. Uh, we joined an alliance for community media that has hundreds of members around the country. Most of them are stations that have six and seven figure budgets. I see emails go by me every day of programs in towns that have fewer people than Curry County by hiring people for 50, 60, $80,000 to help them do the things that we only do with volunteers. But part of what I see go by me are warnings from the industry of three things that will have an impact on you and your general franchise fees. First, cable subscriptions are decreasing across the country. They're de decreasing though more in areas with younger people than we have in Curry County because younger people tend not to use wires to do anything. So that's really not, I think, a immediate threat to your ability to have your channels and, and your programming on and for me to have my programming on. A second thing that has happened is that there's been an accounting change allowed by the FCC that allows them to allocate some of the discount they give you to sign up for their other services, the bundling savings. They're now allocating some of that to the gross revenue from cable, which reduces the number they pay you 5% of. That has some impact. I don't think it's a threatening impact, and I think it's probably already there, because I can't tell from the people I read about whether it's already been imposed or it was imposed 10 years ago and the, the courts haven't gotten around to dealing with that issue. The more important thing, though, is going to happen this summer. The FCC, under the influence of the large cable companies, have now issued a ruling that Charter 
can deduct from your 5% their cost of providing incidental benefits to the county. And it is clear that the main in incidental benefit they're going to value and deduct from the money you get on that 5% is providing you with the channel. It's, for many places, it's a huge, and I think it's going to be, I don't know, we don't know, but it will be a, a huge impact here. And at some point, hopefully not, you may have to make a decision as to how valuable that free channel is because you're going to get a check one quarter that's without any warning is going to be smaller than it, what it should be. Uh, we have been active in the association. We've been campaigning against it. Both of our federal senators have written to the FCC opposing that rule change. Congressional members around the country are doing it. But at some point, uh, it's unlikely that the chairman of the FCC uh, is going to change his mind. And so that is something we all need to make sure we have a very viable website going forward. But again, I think we've done what we promised to do when we asked you for the permit. I think we, we have a growing group of people excited about it and growing programs. And you know, I mentioned to some of the people waiting to talk here that if, for example, you were to vote to put the sanctuary ordinance on the ballot or someone were to put it on the ballot, we would view one of our government programs would be to do what we did last week, and that's have a town hall and have someone come and present in favor and someone come and present in opposition, and then a wide open discussion from anyone who wishes to stand up and talk, because that's what community media is supposed to be about. So I thank you for your time, and I thank these people for being patient while I talk to you. I'll answer questions. I, I, have, I can give you lists of the programs, the people who are qualified to create programming for us, as well as a list of our advisory council, which is open to anyone who is involved. And I have six sets for Council Huddle. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And as Mr. King was concluding, he talked about what community media uh, is about. And the program we're talking about and the, our authority to collect these funds is under um, a statute that involves uh, three words uh, that all that start with PEG, so they're called PEG funds. And it's um, public, educational, or government. And our group, Mr. King's group, and our uh, working of our um, channel so for instance what we're doing now is under the the G the government part yep. and the E is educational what he described of the work with the students at Brookings High would be educational but I believe we have limited ourselves and we haven't gone full community uh, Mr. King I just wanted to clarify that for the record we're not out on the sidewalk interviewing people. okay you know I, I, I do believe that having a town hall that discusses a, a matter that's on the ballot is governmental and you know we have some great educational programs that are not necessarily coming out of a college or a high school but they're educational uh, tomorrow night there are two people who have written a book and going to talk about the people who are the silk weavers in Laos now to me seeing that program on channel 182 is educational. It may not meet everyone's understanding of what educational is, but across the nation, most PEG channels that are simply education channels would view that as educational. And you know, uh, the other thing I, I know, and I, uh, the Supreme Court is gonna make a decision by June, the end of June, on whether or not even the programming we do as the nonprofit to whom you've granted a permit is subject to the First Amendment. There's a fight going on in Manhattan between the people who run the Manhattan channels, a nonprofit, 
two producers put a show on their channel, the Manhattan Channel, criticizing the Manhattan Channel. And the Manhattan Channel banned them, one for life, <laughs> for being critical of them. And they've not resolved that difference, and the Supreme Court has heard arguments. And it's, I think it's quite likely the Supreme Court is going to rule that whether you do it or I do it, and however we want to call it, we got First Amendment issues. I'm not concerned about the First Amendment. I have not had anyone uh, threaten me with a First Amendment lawsuit or anything else. We, we are prepared, and I think most of the stuff that, as I say, I think a discussion of the Second Amendment is a discussion of government, just like a discussion of the First Amendment is a discussion of government. So one of my questions is, who decides, is, do you have a board that decides, or who decides the actual programming that goes on the station? Well, the permit I have from you makes it very clear that no one in the county can have any input in that. My insurance policy and my corporate documents require, frankly, me as president of a five-member board of directors of a nonprofit to make those decisions. We have a, an advisory council which meets quarterly and we talk about the types of programming. We are starting to set up a programming committee to talk about new programs we could re out, reach out for. For example, we've tried for a long time and I have someone new in the game who has the ability to work with the veterans community and create a whole series of veterans programs. We're looking forward to doing that. But it, it's, you know, frankly, it's me. Uh, so one, one of my, I guess, people that have been in my ear the most about the, the stations is uh, the content at, at times seems to be um, one way and not fairly the other way. Um, and I don't want to get into political debates and all that here, but that seems to be the largest uh, banter around the community. We, we have done only two shows that I think could come close to that. The one was our first show, where all six candidates running for the three offices were invited and three chose not to come. We did a town hall by an elected United States Senator. And as I advise you at that afterwards at that time, if you asked us to do a town hall for you so that you could communicate with the electorate of Curry County, your plans and goals as a county commissioner, we would do it. And uh, I think that's governmental programming. Uh, we don't, you know, I can only censor out obscenity. Uh, I don't think having a town hall by an elected official that wasn't at the time a candidate for re-election yet. It, it, and it was a habit and a practice that all of our federal officials, both senators, our state representative, have followed for, for many, many years to have town halls in each county that they represent. I, I, I don't see that as a political event. I see that as government. And some people are going to be offended by something someone says. That's not the standard for putting a program on it. Any program we have could cause, you know, I didn't have a camera to send to the climate talk down at Checo Library today, or we'd be putting a climate talk on. All right. Commissioner Gold? People will find that offensive. I'm just looking at your website and your programs, and I'm seeing very little that's political here, like hydrangeas, the guy reading a book, one pot meals and soups. So there's a variety here. Uh, I'm not, and I wasn't accusing you of that. Nope. I'm just, these are questions that people I, ask no, I me. I understand that. And, to you, and, and the reason I think Mr. Huddle and I came up with a, a paragraph that was not borrowed from anywhere else as to who makes the decision had that extra sentence in it that said that if anyone at the county, any employee or official at the county tried to interfere that would be viewed as an individual act and not an act of the government so that there'd be no way anyone could sue Curry County for anything. That it's, I, ha I pay a lot of money for insurance to take care of that. 
All right. And I'm very conscious that I can't afford to have that premium go up by doing so. I, I'm not allowed to, my policy doesn't let me do investigatory filming. For, I can't do a, a, a 60 minutes program. I understand. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Enjoy your evening. Just uh, while we're all, before we get started on the next phase of this, if anyone else has a uh, speaker slip that they would like to submit, please do so at this time. And then those will be closed. Not equipped for us. Not uh, equipped. Broadcast yeah, they won't be able to see and hear everything down there. The hallway is the best place because the speakers are out there. Do we need? Do we need more seats out there? When? Hold on. Stuff is not political. Just mostly. That was one of them that there was a huge complaint on was the Merkley one because he basically all he did was lambast our president. A lot of people were offended over that. Give us a couple more minutes. We're putting some more seats out in the hallway. Trying to find some if we have any. All right, Council. Council Huddle. Council Huddle, if you could come in at your convenience. It's okay if I read that. Can't go crime now. Sure we can. Julie, tell Huddle. He's right there. He was right there a minute ago.
Be nice if we had this much interest in all of our meetings, huh? Yes, we're going to start doing one a month at night, though. John, huddle. He's okay. He's okay. We still got him. Check the air. Is the air conditioner on? It's going to get 80 in here in a minute. If anyone else has any speaker slips, bring them up now or forever hold your peace. Council? That's fine. All right, here we go. Let's get started. This is a project, the Second Amendment, uh, Second Amendment Sanctuary Ordinance discussion. I will ask everyone in the room to please be respectful of everyone else. I would also ask everyone in the hallway, if you're talking amongst yourself, it will, it will ruin the limited audio that we do have in the hallway. So I would ask everyone to be respectful quiet while people are speaking so that everyone can hear them clearly and everyone gets a chance to say what was on their mind. Um, Commissioner uh, Boyce wanted to read something that he had. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is an uh, email from uh, Mr. Andre Bay. Uh, Dear Vice Chair Boyce, due to health issues, I cannot afford, or excuse me, cannot attend the workshop today. I plan on speaking. Can I yield my time to Lynn Boniface, please? She will need about four minutes total, so we're actually allowing an extra minute between the two of them if, we, if you can uh, authorize that, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Okay, the other thing I will ask is um, comments will be three minutes. We do have a timer. When you see the yellow timer on, you have about 15 seconds left. When it, when it shows red, we need you to please wrap up. Again, please be respectful of everyone. As you can see, we have a lot of people here on this issue. And I appreciate that. I think it's great. Um, so uh, why don't we go ahead and get started? Um, and please, no, no booing or applauding anyone. Uh, let's all be respectful. So Ms. Boniface, why don't you start? Put the pressure on you right away. No applauding, you said? <laughs> Welcome, Lynn. You have to speak. Everything you say has to be into the microphone. Um, I'll take it for the record. Okay, my name is Lynn Boniface. I live in Pistol River. Um, I'm here as a citizen. And uh, I was going to start a little differently, but since I'm first, I'll, my plan Lynn, changed. Just so you know, JJ, give her about an extra minute. Okay, thank you. Excuse me. Everybody that comes up and speaks might want to adjust the microphone, especially the one on the right. You're oh, right. This, yeah, this just one pull that one over and down. There you go. Five. Thank you. Okay. Ah. Okay, I shouldn't have suggested that. You shouldn't have suggested that. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's going to get me. I'll move over here a little bit. Okay. Uh, okay, the proposed Second Amendment sanctuary ordinance that we're talking about tonight is not an ordinance to remove weapon regulations like some people have indicated. It's an ordinance relating only to the action of county employees. Nowhere in the ordinance does it mention removing any regulations, nor does it address private businesses such as firearm dealers. Our job here today is to bring and discuss information. Contrary to the statement in Ms. Felicity's article in the pilot, we are not asking you commissioners to adopt this ordinance. We are asking you to put it on the ballot. We have never asked you to adopt this ordinance. Additionally, this is a county ordinance and it is not applicable. My understanding is not applicable in city limits. So if you live in Brookings, Gold Beach, Port Orford city limits, you have to have your own ordinance. This is a county ordinance. 
Um, so for those who live in those cities, this really doesn't apply to them. Many people, including some attending this workshop tonight, are using some of the ever popular fear mongering language to try and scare people into believing that if this is passed by the people, all bets are off. That we'll, we will be a lawless county with gunfights in the streets. In reality, things will not change from how they are now. Yeah, they really won't. Except that we will have in, this in place when Salem passes such laws as HB 2251, HB 2505, HB 3149, HB 3223, 3265, SB 5, SB 87, 275, 481, 501, 781, 817, 925, and 978, 14 in total. And I left out a couple of the small ones. Repeat that, please. No. <laughs> I get an extra 10 seconds. <laughs> um, Miss Felicity, and in fact, the entire 97415 group are part of a political agenda that is being carried out by the Socialist Democrats at the local, state, and federal levels to disarm the people. And as much as people might think this is a conspiracy theory, I am not a conspiracy theorist. I have been studying this for quite a while, and this is the case. And this has been going on for years, not just this year. Uh, they use terminology such as common sense gun laws. There is no common sense to their zeal to chip away piece by piece at our Second Amendment rights. It's an agenda, pure and simple. Once the people have no way to fight back, they can be controlled. A society armed with all the facts and the ability to rationally think and reason as individuals is a well-armed society that is not easily overtaken. The issue at hand is not whether we can own and use firearms. The issue is that both Salem and the federal government are on a path to infringe more and more on our God-given right to keep and bear arms, as well as passing legislation that controls more and more aspects of how we live and what we do in our own homes. Many people may not be aware that this is being done in Salem because they just don't pay attention to politics. They just kind of go along living their lives, don't know about what the politicians are doing until it smacks them in the face. Our purpose in wanting to let the people vote on this ordinance has nothing to do with Sheriff Ward or his officers or his deputies or the Board of Commissioners. Um, okay, well, I'm gonna have to, <laughs> I'm gonna have to cut it short, but, um, so I can't finish. Anyway, um, I wanted to thank the commissioners and Sheriff Ward and all his officers and deputies for having taken the oath of office that you've taken as you're the people in our first line of defense when it comes to de supporting and defending our rights and our freedoms. And uh, I do wanna make clear, this is nothing against any person here um, because you may not be in position in four years. Sheriff Ward is not gonna be in position the rest of his life. It's for the future. It's not for today, it's for the future. I understand, all right. Thank, Thank you, Lynn. Mark Furler. Mark Furler, Gold Beach. Um, hi, and thanks for taking my comments. Um, I'm, re I'm retired from uh, law enforcement with uh, I was six years a Curry County Sheriff's Deputy. I was also a Curry County, I mean, uh, Coos County Sheriff's Deputy for a short while. The rest of the time I was with the uh, Oregon State Department of Corrections. And I started hunting when I was 13, and I've held a concealed uh, carry permit for 30 years. And I believe in responsible gun ownership with common sense rules and, and regulations. They help us keep everybody safe, and just like traffic laws and regulations that help keep us safe. <clears throat> Today we're here to give you our opinions on whether the Board of Commissioners should adopt the ordinance or should the people pushing the ordinance put it on the ballot? I believe that the County Board of Commissioners should not endorse this ordinance and that the people should decide. The people should decide. <clears throat> I believe the people behind this uh, don't really, haven't really thought of all the negative impacts on our law enforcement issues, I mean, of uh, liability for the county and the taxpayers or the safety for the uh, citizens of our county. 
And again, I urge the Board of Commissioners to refuse to support this ordinance in any way and allow the people to decide. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Rich Folden. Rich Folden. Judy Kaplan. Judy Kaplan, Brookings, Oregon. I will start with um, my um, resentment of uh, someone uh, designating certain groups as leading the drum or uh, the drum, like uh, 97415 or, quote, social democrats or whatever. I'm here as a citizen, and uh, that's what I'm speaking for, and I think that's what other people in the audience are. Should you decide to pursue sanctuary status, this being a democracy, it is critical that the citizens of Curry County have the right to vote on this proposal. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Jay Rom Romine. Uh, Jay Romine and uh, Brookings, Oregon. Uh, over the years, my time spent in the woods, eight incidences, I have intervened between my dogs and bears with firearms. Uh, it did not work out so well for the first dog. Uh, I truly appreciate the right to do so freely. Thank you for your time. Did you get the bear? And tag. Okay. <laughs> Gary Blanchard. We now have a seat up front if someone wants it. Yeah, good evening. My name is Gary Blanchard and I live in the Pistol River community. Um, I came here basically to find out what this is about because I've read a lot of things or started to read a lot of things and I think it's important. One of the most important issues this county may decide. I do not believe it should ever be considered by ordinance by your membership, um, but certainly put to a vote if it, if it has to be. Um, I thank you for Lynn's uh, comment that it only applies to uh, unincorporated, as I would describe it, uh, Curry County, not not the cities. I didn't know, know that, and that's an important distinction. But it, it can be a slippery slope, and it puts a lot of onus on the cities themselves as well. I uh, think it's important um, that before we consider putting this on the ballot, that we have a legal opinion done on this. I do have great concerns on legal liabilities. Um, if we try to abridge the federal and state laws in any manner. I think that's a very dangerous thing. And I don't want to, as a taxpayer, be forced to try to pay this through increased taxes for any defense of any lawsuit that might result um, from such an action uh, by the county. So I would urge that a, an opinion be given that's legal for the county. And I would ask that that opinion include uh, liability issues so that that's clear to the citizens of the county when that comes to a vote, if it comes to a vote. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Felicity. Good evening. May it please the commission. My name is LaRose Felicity. I live in Brookings, Oregon. Uh, I do have a, a three minute presentation, but if you have any questions about the memos that I've submitted earlier, I'm also here to entertain any questions you may have. Um, earlier, we heard from one proponent of SASO and they said that this does not prevent anyone from enforcing any laws. Let's see, let me quote. It says, no agent, department, employee, or official of Curry County shall knowingly and willingly participate in any way in the enforcement of any extraterritorial act as defined herein regarding personal firearms, firearms accessories, or ammunition. And then it, there's a long list in here of the types of laws that already exist that cannot be enforced under this or 
the enforcing officer shall suffer a $2,000 fine. All right, why don't we want this? We have a duty to operate in a system of laws. Those who want SASO want enforcement of all federal and all federal and state laws about firearms to be a finable act. This just isn't legal. As you know, the real legal system works like the military. The highest general orders everybody around. Below him, the chain of command, each higher officer over a lower one. In the courts, the biggest court, the highest court, the Supreme Court makes the rules for all the lower courts. They interpret and, and enforce those rulings. If we decide here today to ignore what the Supreme Court, the federal court, and the appellate courts of Oregon have ruled, we destroy this system and lose the power of the rule of law. What rules do we operate under then? Once the SASO opponents are given the authority to tell Sheriff Ward what to do, who's next? We must uphold the rule of law or we are plunged into chaos. Who will know what to do then? The scope of the real Second Amendment. Those trying to make the new chaotic rules today said that the United States versus Heller holds that all local, state, and federal acts on firearms and ammunition are a violation of the Second Amendment. Not so fast. The, their case, U.S. v. Heller, says just the opposite. It holds specifically at page 636, the rights secured by the Second Amendment are not unlimited or absolute over any other rules and statutes. It actually says the Second Amendment does not protect weapons not typically possessed by law-abiding citizens, such as short-barreled shotguns, or change prohibitions on the prohibition of firearms by felons and the mentally ill, or laws forbidding the carrying of firearms in sensitive places, or laws imposing conditions and qualifications on the commercial sale of arms. Since Heller, the lower courts and the Supreme Court has defined over 21 ways that firearms can be lawfully regulated. And what will happen if this is, this is breached? In Nearing versus Weaver in City of St. Helens, the Supreme Court of Oregon rules that a statute that says shall arrest, in this case a violator of a domestic violence order, means shall arrest, and those who refuse to do so can be sued. If also, it also will not take Sheriff Ward or you causing injury to a citizen under an unenforced law to create county liability. Let's please reject this. It's unlawful and it is um, not productive for our county. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? No. It's Cala Felicity. Thank you, commissioners. Can you hear me? Yes. I have a very soft voice, so I'm hoping it's caring. I come here today to tell you that um, I've watched uh, LaRose uh, Felicity practice law uh, when she was an active attorney in Kentucky, watched her do constitutional cases, and have helped her uh, in research for those cases, and that these two memorandums of law which she presented to you are extremely thoroughly researched. and. Um, took hours to prepare. Three minutes is not a fair hearing of them, and I hope that you'll all read them. Also, I wanted to correct a misunderstanding that 97415 includes only the, quote, city of Brookings. The city of Brookings only covers four precincts in this county. The rest of the precincts around the city are not answerable to the city in many ways, and we depend on the resources of the county, especially in Harbor, we depend on the resources of the county to be fairly uh, distributed among the citizens of the county in law enforcement and other services that the county provides. And those of us who pay both city taxes and county taxes on our property, we are glad that the county exists outside those four precincts to enforce the law. And the law currently says that um, Sheriff Ward shall enforce the laws of the state and the laws of the United States. And to put Sheriff Ward and his deputies, or whoever is the sheriff at that point, in the position of having to figure out, am I in the city limits of Brookings? Am I in the city limits of Port Orford? Am I in the city limits of Gold Beach? Or can I arrest, or if I arrest, am I gonna be fined by whom? Am I gonna be fined by the county for carrying out state law? It's the uh, egregious, misstatements in this um, 
proposed ordinance are so complicated and numerous that to address just a few of them on a ballot would be quite challenging to a voter who's well educated in these matters. I state my position is that we should not put it on a ballot. The commissioner should study it and do what the city council did in uh, Brookings just recently and say this is not a thing that we need to do to tell our law officers they're going to get fined for upholding the law or they are going to who knows what's going to happen if they don't uphold the law let's see that we could just sue the whole county and then all of us suffer not just people in one area code so I'm done thank you Jack Pruitt Uh, I'm Jack Pruitt. I live in Fort Orford. I've been there uh, 30 years. I have an honorable discharge from the United States Navy. I served during the Korean War. I also receive a pension from the Detroit Fire Department for time served there. It was my great honor to do there. And uh, so <clears throat> I do realize the importance of having guns, weapons by the way I've lived. And <clears throat> when it comes to making laws for how to, who can carry a gun, where you can carry them, and this and that, we elect people to go to Washington and Salem to make these laws. <clears throat> and so far, the people that have made the laws, the gun laws pertaining in Oregon, there has not been one of those laws that has been overturned by the Supreme Court. So I have full confidence that the laws made coming out of Salem are very thought out and very practical and I do support them. As far as this ordinance that we're talking about now, the sanctuary ordinance, I think that we're stepping into territory that we don't belong. And <clears throat> furthermore, just if we did vote for it and passed, that does not mean it would stand the muster if it was appealed up to the Supreme Court. In fact, in my, uh, I guess you would say, uneducated uh, legal opinion, it would not pass muster. So I would ask that you do not put it on the ballot and that you turn it down. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <coughs> Lou Costa. Mr. Lou. Good evening. <clears throat> I fully support putting it on the ballot. In today's coastal pilot, a letter was written that asked, why do we need guns? The military armed forces will protect us all. That's malarkey. The American Hunter magazine has a monthly column with eight to 10 incidences of armed citizens in every state who have been protecting themselves and their families, mostly from home invasions, rape, personal attacks, from criminals with various weapons. This is it right here. I myself was attacked in 1976 by a member of a motorcycle gang I was stabbed five times, almost died, and I have the scars to prove it. He had recently been released after spending years in prison for torturing and stabbing another victim with a knife. Since 1976, I have had a concealed weapons license to protect myself and my family from anything like that ever happening again. I keep my weapon readily available. I believe these gun laws are politically designed to prevent good and lawful gun owners from having a gun and to discourage you from wanting a gun. These laws do nothing at all to make criminals comply. Nothing at all. I urge 
the Curry County Commissioners to help us make this sanctuary county to protect our constitutional gun rights and tell our gun-hating legislators and governor, no, not in this county you don't. Who in the world don't believe that Nancy Pelosi and Dianne Feinstein and Governor Kate Brown don't have the best security that anyone could possibly have? Walls and security. What's good for the goose should be good for the gander. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Rob Taylor. <clears throat> thank you, commissioners, for allowing me to speak today. And I want to thank everyone who's attendant. Uh, this is very important. It's a very important subject. And I think it's something that we do need to talk about because it is something that is very of concern to many of the people that I am here to represent. I belong to the committee to preserve the Second Amendment. And I'm the gentleman who wrote the Second Amendment Sanctuary Ordinance. And I know what it does. And I know exactly what it doesn't do. And a lot of people here are a little bit confused on those aspects. And this law has been checked over, reviewed, and over-reviewed by at least a dozen or so attorneys. In fact, there's a very similar law in Josephine County that Wally Hicks wrote. Wally Hicks is an attorney. He uh, was a representative in the state house, so he's someone who's very familiar with what's constitutional and what will stand up to constitutional muster. This law does not have anything to do with firearms or firearms accessories. It does not have anything to do with making them against the law because a county cannot null and void a state or federal law. But what you can do is you can have an anti-commandeering directive. And what that means is that as a people in a county, you can decide what you're going to spend your money on. And anyone who says that's illegal must be against sanctuary state status that we have in Oregon. Oregon is a sanctuary state where illegal immigrants are allowed to come here. And when they fall afoul of the law, sheriffs and police officers cannot, cannot do anything to help our federal immigration officers to get rid of these bad perpetrators. That is the same exact law that you have before us, except that other than pertaining to illegal immigrants, it pertains to firearms. Now, if we can have sheriffs not uphold really good immigration laws that we probably all, most in this room, support, then why shouldn't we allow our sheriffs not to uphold very bad gun regulation coming out a very leftist legislative body where one party has control, the majority super control of the House, has majority control of the Senate, has the majority control of the governor's office, and we're supposed to trust them to pass common sense gun laws. And I can tell you, I've been up there a half a dozen times since the legislative session has been in session, and I can tell you these people want to disarm the citizens of this state. Plain and simple. And I don't care what anyone says about common sense gun laws. Any law against a gun is not common sense. We need laws that pertain to criminals. In this law, if any criminal uses a gun wrongly or in the commission of a crime, nothing stops a cop from arresting him. A felon cannot be in possession of a, of a gun, and that says right in this law. What it does eliminate is all of the regulations and rules on law-abiding gun owners. And right now, if the law is passed the way they are written in Salem, I and a good portion of the people of this community are going to be criminals. So what's a bigger liability? Having to pay a lawyer to defend your rights or losing your rights? Thank you. Thank you, sir. Ted Hyatt. Ted Hyatt. Well, he was just out there. Here, I'll take it out. Yeah, thank you. Doug Lewis. Uh, well, uh, the first thing I'd be concerned with is uh, the liability for the county if you get into a situation like, say, uh, uh, Ruby Ridge or Waco, Texas, where the federal government came in and set fire to a building, slaughtered a bunch of people inside the compound, 
and, uh, and then Ruby Ridge where they uh, shot a woman holding a baby. And people think, uh, wow, this could never happen. Well, guess what? It really can happen. And uh, so imagine some law-abiding citizen who happens to have a magazine or a couple of magazines that hold too many rounds that used to be legal. Uh, California is a good example. Does anybody have any idea how many magazines have been turned into the state of California that were over the capacity? I think one person could probably carry them all quite easily in one hand. So here we have a situation where the sheriff is going to go after someone who's committed no crime, but he may have one too many rounds in a magazine and now he's a criminal and he's probably not willing to just give those up and go to jail for 10 years or subject himself to a $10,000 fine or whatever. Maybe he believes in some of the constitutional rights and is willing to fight for it. Do we want to put our sheriff's deputy and the, the handful of deputies we have in that kind of jeopardy for what? Uh, I, I, I can't imagine very many people in Curry County turning in their weapons. Uh, didn't happen in California, and I, I, I probably know uh, over 100 people in California who I suspect have never turned in their weapons. And, uh, and neither, none of them that I know of are criminals, but uh, technically uh, they could probably uh, be subject to a, a federal or state or even local raid. And out of that hundred, there might be one or two that aren't going to appreciate it one bit or are going to be willing to fight for their rights. There could be some serious loss of life. Now we, we have what, 10, 12 deputies? How many do we have here in Curry County? And there's going to be out of the thousands and thousands of individuals that have weapons legally owned at this time, when they suddenly become illegal, out of those many thousands here in Curry County, there's going to be one or two individuals that are going to say no. And I would hate to see any of our deputies injured or even worse over a stupid law that has no right to be passed. Sure, Salem can do whatever they want. We don't have enough voting power but they don't represent Curry County. They represent their interests in Salem. We don't, we don't have enough representation. Thank you, sir. Tony Bechtel. I got that right, huh? Thank you, Chair and Commissioners. I'm new to Curry County. Um, one thing I want to say is uh, we really want a recession-proof uh, county. So um, one of the things that we can do to do that is to avoid further liability. LO LA County's budget is riddled with the uh, lawsuits of um, people suing um, for whatever reasons. And so we feel like the less lawsuits that our county um, has to go through that that you know the better so when we're um, looking at creating law-abiding citizens as um, you know putting them in a uh, felon class then we're building a larger felon class than the Democratic Party um, then they have a mandate that's larger than the Democrats themselves so we don't think that that's a very great idea either um, the other thing is that the chief the chief in Detroit and other sheriffs have come out and said that they appreciate uh, law-abiding armed citizens as a help in case um, they need it. And so I appreciate that and I appreciate those who come and, and that are well-trained. I would actually like training for more of our citizens, especially our women. Um, now, up in, um, I'm getting a little nervous. I'm, this is the first time I've done this, so I apologize. <laughs> For um, Sheriff Ward, I really like him. I like everybody who serves and I totally appreciate it. He did come out to the building once and we had a conversation with other sheriffs and they had asked me, 
why do you guys do business with people who are criminals? And I said, well, we're not privy to that information, so we don't know. We're here to serve the public, and we can't discriminate. So how do we tell? We don't know. So um, a lot of people don't actually know that, so we, how do we know? Um, how do we defend ourselves from those type of people who um, don't follow the rules like the sheriffs had asked me? They don't follow rules. Well, w how do we defend ourselves if you disarm us? So those are the, some of the thoughts that I have. And I, again, appreciate you guys, all the work that everybody does and everybody that shows up. And thank you so much for everybody and your civic duty. Thank you. Thank you. Dave Triggett. Well, fortunately, I can be pretty brief because, frankly, I think a lot of the comments that have come before me, uh, uh, I would agree with. I just want to second um, my, my primary sentiment on this. First of all, I am in support of the, the ordinance. And uh, I have been concerned, even prior to this coming up, about the position that we are putting the sheriff and our law enforcement, or other law enforcement officers in. Uh, they might be ultimately in a position where they have to enforce these um, these rules, these laws that have been sort of creeping in from uh, opposing the Second Amendment or, or certain uh, elements of it. Um, and I'm just going to cut to the chase here and say these are these have these are of uh, nefarious intent. You know, a lot of the people who are saying, well, these are reasonable gun laws and this, and you look at what's going on around the country with them. There does appear to be an agenda to disarm us, and I don't think that's you know, a conspiracy theory. That's just an honest assessment of what's going on. And it's not just firearms. We see it in other elements of our lives, whether it's food safety, uh, the demonization of the vaccine awareness movement. There does seem to be this general trend towards abridgment of our rights and our ability to make our decisions about our lives. And it just doesn't seem to me to be right to put the sheriff in a position where he's got to come up, you know, up to my place and disarm me because suddenly something I have has been declared illegal or dangerous. It puts me in a bad position because I've got to make a decision on whether I'm really going to, you know, am I a real American? Or am I really going to, you know, support what I see as that, that right? So that's about it. I think people are doing a pretty good job talking about this, so I'll leave it at that. Thank you, sir. Marsha Tribodeau? How was that? All right. <laughs> Strictly by accident. I'm Marcia Thibodeau. I live in Brookings, and I'm here in opposition with this proposal. I'm coming here as a citizen, and my hope was there would be more regulations. And finding out that you're talking about less regulations concerned me. I've spent the last 30 years working as a teacher, counselor, and school psychologist. And I've been on campuses, and I've seen what has happened with shootings. It isn't something anymore where maybe one student brings a gun to school. But the thought of automatic weapons frightens me. My experiences are not just watching television of something that happened in Las Vegas or in a movie theater. My experience is actually being there, looking at the trauma that not only affected the student and their family, or just the entire school, but the community that were affected for years to come. I had students who were cutting themselves because they said they wanted to start feeling again. Post-traumatic stress is very common when children and adults are exposed to situations that a human being cannot withstand. It can be the fire department, it can be the sheriff's department, it can be EMTs who are exposed to horrific situations. But you put children in that situation where the, the parents don't want them to come to school because they're afraid something will happen. Children can't concentrate on their subjects 
people, teachers are wondering why aren't they paying attention? Because they're traumatized. I've seen adults who are no longer effective in their jobs because they're fearful of being shot by another member and coworker or because they've experienced seeing what has happened in mass shootings. So I was hoping that there would be a proposal for mental health services or a proposal for the schools to have counselors on staff. But I'm finding out that we're now talking about equipping people with more equip more power than just a gun to go hunting. So thank you for listening and I'm hoping we can get a proposal to help so many people in this county who need mental health services. Thank you. Thank you. Tracy Rupp. speech and I hope I can be civil because I'm so sick and tired of this BS. Where to begin? This is right-wing radicalism sponsored by the GOP to get you f frightened about this, that, and the other thing about the invasion of poor people at the border and Everything so you can vote the GOP so the GOP can do their thing. And what's that? To cut taxes on the super wealthy every damn time. We're gonna have to use a different I've been subject. watching him. Sir? For at least four decades. Settle down just a little bit, please. Well, that's what's really going on here. <laughs> I've heard so much falsity. I am a liberal. I vote Democratic because we liberals don't have a party of our own. And you want to tell me that this country is being taken over by the liberals and the socialists? This is a lie that gets perpetuated over and over again. And it's a sickening piece of crap. I'm a lifelong liberal and I'm not a socialist and I don't know many of us who are socialists and yet you hear that lie over and over again. Sir, you're going to have to stay please. to the subject, please. You got your, you talk about your worries about the Constitution. You got a president right now who's threatening that Constitution. Call a recess. Beat the band. Call a recess. Stop. Stop. Go ahead. You want to stop me? This is what's going on. The truth of the matter, the real threat to this country is crazy Republicanism. That's enough. That's enough, sir. That's enough. You're done. Did you do the timer on here? You're done. Did you do the timer on here? Whoa. It's not my place to apologize, but I will, and I thank everyone for remaining calm. You can come back in, ma'am. May we continue, please, with Paul Goodell. Mr. Goodell. My name is Paul Goodell. I represent myself as a citizen of Brooklyn, Oregon. Could you pull that top one down just a little bit? Here there we go again. Is that all right? All right. I want you to hear my breathing on this thing too much. Um, <clears throat> I'm in here in support of the ordinance. Um, if there's some concerns about the language, I can see where that kind of comes from. I haven't heard any straight answers back about the language on that from the commissioners or the sheriff or anyone for that matter. Um, but I do support it being a countywide directive and not putting all the burden on the sheriff himself, you know? And uh, <clears throat> what it really kind of comes down to, Rob pretty much hit the other talking points, so I don't need to repeat what he said. What I really have a concern with is right now in this state, we do have a massive amount of bills up in Salem, you know, that if they do get passed, examples 941, which died in committee, but I'll probably see that next year and 978, that if it does pass, it's gonna turn a large portion of the population of this county into felons overnight. So I am not a felon today, but I will be a felon after this gets passed, you know? And you're kind of our last safeguard, you know, to preventing that. And uh, <clears throat> similar stuff has been passed in Joe County, uh, 
Missouri, the whole statewide passed something similar to this. You know, so I think it actually might be a pretty good idea. What I do not like about gun control or the advocates of gun control is I have never met a gun control advocate that decided that I grew up and I saw my friend get shot and I decided I'm gonna get into law enforcement and be the first guy through the door to take people's guns and get those things off the street. It's a constant game with pretty much you're taking law enforcement and you're pitting them against the law-abiding citizens here. So you're putting law enforcement in the position of you want to keep your job, you want to keep your status here, then you better go enforce this tyrannical law. And you're putting the citizen in the spot where it's do you want to keep your rights, you want to be subjugated, or you want to be a criminal? And I don't want us to be put in that spot. And the people that are proposing these common sense gun control laws are going to sit in the sidelines. They don't have really that much skin in the game, honestly. So I really think uh, we should get this through. If there's some changes that need to be put in the language, I could totally think about that. But we need to actually have a meeting and discuss that and have a back and forth exchange because I haven't heard what the problems with the language is yet. Um, touching on Heller, I think we also left the part out where it talked about weapons lawfully owned for common use. You know, and I think a lot of people are blurring. Um, the line between dangerous and unusual weapons and weapons that are lawfully owned for common use. Is that a minute or 15 seconds? I think one. Is that a one minute? Okay. That's about a 30, 30, seconds. Seconds. 30 seconds. 30 seconds. Okay. Is it appropriate for me to ask for a show of hands in here? If you'd like, people can participate okay. or not. Okay. Who supports a ban on AR-15s? Anyone else? Okay. Okay. Um, who supports the Second Amendment? Okay. Well, we were trying to get an example of what the AR-15 ban was. That is a weapon that is lawfully owned and in common use. There are over 15 million of those guns in the country. There's 75 million magazines. And basically what you're asking for, they are responsible for less than 300 murders a year out of the 9,000 gun homicides that we actually have. That pretty much meets the criteria of a commonly owned weapon for lawful purposes. Okay. So I'm going to wrap it up on that. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you, guys. You. Is Rich Follin here? I can tell from the from two or three of the people that have spoken that um, quiet, this please. Is, this is obviously uh, um, what's called a, a I recall a hot button issue. Hot button issue being one uh, about which people are uh, have a have a strong emotional uh, sense about one that uh, issues that uh, that raise our hackles if we think that we're, we're on the wrong side or the right side. And this is a hot button issue. Thank God we only uh, have uh, in this country in my lifetime, there have only been five or six so-called hot button issues. Abortion, uh, prayer in schools, homosexual marriage, now immigration, and now here today, uh, gun control. And those are all hot button issues. And I think the prudent thing to do I don't want to speak to the substance uh, on either side, but you're, you're at danger at driving the wedge deeper and wider among the, the citizens of our country. Rural America against city people and suburbanites, Portland versus Curry County, Josephine County, blacks and whites, ethnic groups, tribes, national uh, dedications. It, I think the smart thing to do is where do what uh, I think there's an, a, something in jurisprudence where you avoid you avoid making a decision when you can because it often causes more problems than uh, than what existed before and I, th I think the smart thing to do for you commissioners and uh, I hope this doesn't get on the ballot measure because this is just going to cause more and more an antagonism rancor anger real anger that we've seen here just now. Thank you, sir. Does Ted Hyatt come back? Okay, at this time, comments are closed. Is there any further discussion between commissioners? Mr. Boyce? Thank you, Mr. Chair. First, I want to thank the board and staff for going to the trouble to have this meeting tonight. You know, workshop means work. And so you have a healthy dialogue. Everybody needs to learn, without exception, I think, to develop their skill of listening and actually hearing. Somebody just said a hot button issue. You know, I've known Doug Lewis for 50 years, maybe. And he mentioned 
Ruby Ridge, Randy Re Weaver, certainly you mentioned uh, what happened in Texas. And people, as you said, didn't think that could happen. The government handled, mishandled that horrible. If they'd have taken maybe Chuck Swindoll or Charles Stanley or even James Dobson and went in to talk to David Koresh, who was a total kook, if they would have just went down and sat down with him and said, hey, here's what our Bible says. How do you interpret it? They maybe could have saved 84 lives. And instead, you know the rest of the story. Unbelievably tragic. There was a letter in the pilot today that said uh, Boyce gets his way. The he thinks the military's going to cave in the front door or whatever. I don't know the exact quote. Give me a break. That is a quote. And so when you have a responsibility to understand history, um, and you go back and you review that, and what has happened when the people are disarmed or have fear that they're going to be disarmed, what makes America different is that freedom, that liberty, and how we've been able to maintain that for 200 and some years. Why did the Founding Fathers set that up so that the people within their own homes could defend themselves? Because the British were caving in their door in the middle of the night and terrorizing their families, or worse. And people say, that can't happen now. OK, uh, I hope not. My grandfather, when he was county commissioner here, when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, he and the other two commissioners and the sheriff, the four of them, took turns, 12-hour shifts, for five days, one at each end of the Rogue River Bridge in case the Japanese sent a submarine in the bay. They were going to defend their country at all costs. And they would have. So my grandfather was alive today. By the way, that 32 Winchester rifle that he had, I have to this day. And uh, under Senate Bill 978, that gun would be illegal. Um, I have responsibility. We all have responsibility to protect ourselves, our families, our homes, our neighbors, and protect the peace. I said on Rob's radio show the other day, that's the way I was raised, and that's what I believe. Where do we go from here, Mr. Chair? I really appreciate this dialogue. I appreciate that almost everybody was really cool and calm and wanting to be productive and wanting to be heard. And that was the basis for us having this, this workshop today. Uh, you heard Wally Hicks mentioned, uh, Josephine County uh, Council. I watched him at the legislature. Uh, one of the terms that he was there, I think it was three terms, uh, an Iraqi war veteran. And I went to dinner with him one night back in, I think, 2011. And he was telling the story of General Sanchez during the Iraqi, the height of the Iraqi war, and General Schwarzkopf, that he had three big screens the size of the back wall there. And he had to monitor, he and his staff had to monitor, Wally well, Hicks' staff had to monitor that, those three screens. There was absolutely no room for the slightest bit of air because when the generals come in, they needed information right now, and it had to be 100% reliable. There's a guy that would have give up his life for his country in an instant. And there's a lot of people in this room, maybe most of us, that would do that. They love their country that much. They love their families that much. They understand their responsibility. I'm winding down here, sir. But he's come up with, um, as I understand from Director Schmelzer, that was unanimous between the three Josephine County Commissioners, and they passed it. And I have it here, and I won't ask us all, this is the most hypersensitive mouse you'll ever see. Um, and I'm not saying this is the route we should go. I am concerned that anybody would recommend that we not have something go before the vote of the people. This is a democracy. I trust that people uh, we'll be well informed and understand the importance of that. Um, I'll just scroll down. Just, I just, I just want to emphasize how much I trust this guy and his counsel, his uh, legal background, his commitment. I can't possibly offer a greater pa representation of a greater patriot to our country. Um, but if you'd just take the time to go through uh, at least the last page of the whereas's, uh, it gives us that safety and security. Maybe that's the direction we want to go. Uh, maybe we want to go back to what I have not supported the present 
uh, Second Amendment sanctuary ordinance um, because there's some things in it that uh, disturb me a little bit. But I think there's a direction here we can go to bring everybody together and put it before our county. It might even be something that we can offer uh, and the commissioner can have the courage to vote on this. And that would make, uh, well, that's the responsibility we have, the responsibility we have, and that's the beauty of a representative go government. That's what we're here to do. Um, and so I'm going to recommend, Mr. Chair, that um, this will be on my website, my portion of the county website. I would suggest that people take some time, review this, study it backwards, forward, sideways. It's already, I think, uh, Mr. Taylor can correct me if I'm wrong, it's been passed by a few counties in Oregon. Come up to the microphone, if you would, please. Put you on the spot here a little bit. Uh, this one here, as you can see, has been uh, passed by Josephine County, and I do want to kind of point out where this whereas is the Charter of Josephine County, Section 29.1, Section 1 states, the right to keep, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. That was the very first Second Amendment Preservation Ordinance that was passed in 1994 by this county before even Wally Hicks was on the board. And that was passed, I believe, by an initiative by the people of Josephine County. And that was the one that was taken into consideration when Wallawa County passed the Second Amendment Preservation Ordinance in 2015. But currently, the only county that has passed and enacted a Second Amendment Sanctuary Ordinance is Josephine County, but Deschutes County, Harney County, Columbia County has an initiative that's been filed. All of those are in the process, and I can guarantee you by the time we're taking this out of uh, Columbia County because it's in court right now, by the time we get it out of there, we're going to be able to hit at least 20 counties. And the reason that it's in court is not because of the content, because it was they were just ruling on whether it could be filed as an initiative. They told us there was three reasons that it couldn't be filed in Columbia County. They said it was administrative instead of legislative. We met that and we beat it. We beat that in court. They said that it was uh, a more than a single subject. We proved that wrong because it only gave one directive. But where we failed on the court case was that it didn't have the full text. And what the judge had ruled is that it was ambiguous because basically of the word any and the laws that were excluded written in the, in the text. And, and it says that any laws that are passed in the future, he said, wouldn't be something that the people could uh, choose because they don't know what laws those are going to be. So that ambiguity was a reason to reject it. Our attorney has changed the wording in the Second Amendment Sanctuary Ordinance, which is, which is an exact duplicate of the one that we submitted to you to review. And we have changed the wording of that to where it almost fits exactly more like the Josephine County because of the legal challenge on it. But we have taken that and we have changed it. And so far right now, Columbia County is not accepting that. And once they go through, and by the way, this was accepted in Coos County. My uh, commissioners, we, you know, I, I submitted it to, you know, we had talked to them and then I submitted it as an initiative. And our county clerk, our county attorney, accepted it as it was written as we submitted it to you. So the ordinance has already been looked at by county attorneys and by the district attorney. So if anyone was worried about the content, I think it would have came up during those times. But the fact is, is nothing can be found unconstitutional until it's a law. So for anyone to worry about the content, the only way to find out whether it's constitutional or not, you got to put it into law because you can't find out that fact until it's been adjudicated, and the only way it could be adjudicated is if it's been passed. Thank you, Mr. Taylor. Is that it? No, but I'll have more later. I want no, to go ahead. I want to know. OK. Um, when you look at what's going on in Salem, for uh, lack of a better description, the blue part of the state, um, we know that there are people, legislators, that do not believe in the Second Amendment and the restrictions are going to grow even if 978 fails this year it will return and the proof of that is every session it gets a little more restrictive grows a little bit more I, I do see this as a way to bring the county together and that's our job public safety is our number one program and responsibility Mr. Lewis also mentioned that how many deputies do we have in Curry County well we know we don't have enough and so when the phone rings and 911 doesn't work we restrict 
the people in Salem, excuse me, the, the legislators in Salem, but the voters in Portland, Eugene to some extent, would take away our right and uh, our rights and those, those individual freedoms. And uh, we're, this is an opportunity to tell the whole world uh, that we understand what our rights and responsibilities are and we're willing to go out on a limb um, and, uh, and achieve that. We're just going to have to do it with either this system or back the SASO. That's going to take some time. That's not an attempt to, to delay, Mr. Chair, uh, but I think we have to take a real prudent approach. And again, I see this as an opportunity to bring this county together and get something that we can support and either the commissioners decide, show some courage, or we get it to the voters. But to say, do not send it to the voters, I, that, that really concerns me. That's all I have, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Commissioner Gold? I don't have anything at this time. I would like to say this. Our founding fathers came here um, to start a new land and wrote the laws that they wrote into our Constitution. I believe they've stood the test of time for centuries. And to, uh, to have the foresight that they had uh, and still have in that language is amazing to me. I don't think um, without armed citizens in this nation that we would still be a country. I believe one of the reasons America has lasted with the strength and unity that we have with our men and women in this nation and our children is because most of us in this nation grew up holding a gun or knew someone that did. But the bigger point to that is we let everyone in the world know, you come here, we're going to fight. We've got a lot of ex-military in this nation that were raised old school, and they're not going to let someone come into our land and take what we have without a fight. My fear is future generations that we have going forward are starting to weaken. Our kids, our grandchildren, are starting to fall in line with what are, is being taught to them and the, the gross things that they're being told that we can now have babies full term decided if they're going to be given a right to live or not. And I'm not going to get off topic here, but to have this kind of direction in this nation now is frightening to me. Sir, I'm a Vietnam veteran. And I just, uh, uh, Commissioner Boyd, would like to uh, correct you. Would you like to come up to the microphone, please, ma'am? Certainly. Thank you. Certainly. What are we doing here? <clears throat> she, she, she wants to correct me. I'm sorry. No, I'm. My name is Marion Rawls. I'm a Vietnam veteran. I live in Brookings, Oregon. I've enjoyed uh, living in this wonderful area for a number of years now. Um, uh, Commissioner Boyce, I think you're incorrect when you say that people in Salem do not support the Second Amendment. Uh, people do support the Second Amendment. The question is, how much do Second Amendment rights supersede the rights of us to live peacefully and safely. And that issues are not necessarily as black and white as we like to make them. And I'm disappointed that uh, this topic has gone off onto uh, uh, immigration and abortion and uh, the liberal left and all of this. Unfortunately, to me, it reveals the, uh, the bias of the commissioners and the lack of willingness to uh, uh, look at things objectively and to try and observe things from a neutral point of view in order to resolve issues and to look at things so that we as a community can honor each other's rights and uh, each other's points of view. Thank so you, I'm very, very saddened by this display. Thank you. Thank you for your service, ma'am, in Vietnam. Much appreciated.
what my point was was that the I want to say this the fabric of a lot of our laws in the, in the gun laws are I, I referenced something last week and it kind of applies to this as well it's like a dead animal on the road and, a, and the crows keep landing on it and picking a little bit more off and a little bit more off and that's the deterioration that I've seen in a lot of the gun laws in this nation however I do not personally believe that this should be an issue at the county level. I believe if we want to see something like this pass, it should be initiative that is taken through the state and not the county to watch the counties, the rural counties of this state come together and do a state mandate or a state addendum, uh, a referendum on this, uh, I believe is the way to go with this. Um, we already have something in place that uh, the past commission, Brock Smith and a couple others put in place that is similar language to this. And yes, it was not voted on by the public, but it was put through the Board of Commissioners. We had, they had workshops on it and they came up with it and it is in place currently in the county. But I believe this, I believe in defending our nation. I believe in defending our families and the land we live in at all costs. I'm a Marine. I have myself served as did everyone, every member of my family, brothers and sisters, two of my uncles. My grandfather was on a cavalry unit that chased Pancho Villa, believe that or not. I believe in defending our nation at all costs, but I don't believe that doing this at a county level and then having the state step in and say, at a, as a county, you cannot do this, it's illegal. They have, these officers are sworn as are we to uphold this, the laws of the state of Oregon. Do I agree with them? Not necessarily. But I do not believe that our sheriff or any of his deputies will, will, will legally be allowed to abide by this unless it's done at a state level. And I would urge everyone here that if you want to do something like this, to look at it from a state level, and now you can really change it, cause effect in something, and not do it at a county level. That's what, Commissioner Boyce. Thank you again. Uh, we may have a disagreement here. I am biased, and I'm biased for the Bill of Rights and the Constitution because that's the thread that holds us Amen. together as communities. I think as elected officials in this county, compared to people that we do not elect in the urban part of this state, and you see it around the country, uh, I, I think we could be very derelict in our responsibility to let them keep moving forward. And uh, I'm going to hang my hat on the responsibility the county does have, and I believe that that's why I was elected. And uh, that right there shows and offers a, a pr an approach that we could take if it, if uh, to give it and, and keep the citizens' rights there. Thank okay. you. As a workshop, we are not l legally allowed to make any decisions here tonight. Um, this is something that may come up in the future. Um, so we just want you to know that this is just a workshop atmosphere and at this time I'd like to thank everyone for coming and appreciate everyone being Mr. Boyce I can wait till after you're done sir oh, go ahead where do we go from here I would I would like to recommend to the board before we close this meeting that we have another workshop consider another workshop perhaps early June maybe even into May Four weeks too soon. I'd uh, defer to staff on that. I know we got a pretty heavy uh, workload, but I think we need to bring the people back together. And I, I again, I'm going to I'm going to look at that in a positive sense, the opportunity we have. But I don't want to close this meeting down, Mr. Chair, unless we have some sense of direction that we can go. I've suggested that people get on a website and review that. Uh, w thoughts from the other board members here on how to proceed. Well, I think people have had an opportunity to speak tonight, which I think is a good thing. And I think at this point, we're going to have to make a decision, yes or no, is it going to go on the ballot? I don't think another workshop is, is going to make a whole lot of difference. I think, well, I mean, I, I'm not going to say if it would or not, would not be. I mean, again, am I against this? Uh, no, I'm not. I, and I want everyone to know, I'm, no, I'm not. Some of the language in this, um, I believe, um, is going to be found to be, uh, for, for lack of a better word, illegal for our sheriffs to be able to do. Um, so to have a workshop, another workshop, I would, I, again, we've got to have the workshop 
with with open to the public. But in order to, to deal with something like this, if you're talking about, like you said earlier, um, the radio, Mr. Taylor, Mr. Taylor, you said earlier, you know that the, this, you, if there are words in here, how do we get it fixed? We fix it through a workshop, but we can't have a workshop if we can't sit at a table and work these kind of things out. So to, you know, to maybe have another workshop, and I want to say I'm sorry, budget season is on us, and we've got until uh, just a, just. You know, May is pretty well shot with budget, and we've got till the end of June to get a budget out and a, and a zero balance budget. So, with all um, to have something in the future um, where we have a group of people that want to sit and listen, and and let a, a small group of people um, that maybe everyone contributes to the language in that to work something out on that. Uh, I'm, I'm not saying I'm opposed to that, but uh, but at this point. I think we all probably will agree that this is something that if any state passes is going to end up in our Supreme Court. So um, and that and that may be a good thing as well. well thank you again. Um, with all due respect, this might be more important than budgets. The hearts, minds, and souls have been exposed by these people here. They've come, they've testified both sides. I've learned a lot. I've got a lot more to learn. I don't want to, I don't want to squander the, another opportunity. I don't want to un have unnecessary meetings. But I think uh, uh, there's just there's too much passion on both sides of this. Just to kind of, as as one uh, person testified, don't do anything. You might make things worse. I think we got to take that risk. That's why we were hired here. But that's all I've got, Mr. Chair. I'm going to be calling for another meeting. It'll be up to the board to decide if uh, if, if another workshop is uh, unnecessary. Thank you. Okay. That's all we have for this evening. Thank everyone for coming. We're adjourned.